Hello and welcome to Swipe. Coming up, let's get it on. Why more tech companies are moving into music. On your bike, we check out the latest cycling gadgets to help you hit the road. Webby winners, New York celebrates some of the internet's biggest stars. And from side-scrolling shooters to sci-fi RPGs, we've got the lot on this week's review. Online music plays are giving companies instant access to a community of passionate users. But who's cashing in on the growing trend? And what are the consequences for the music industry? Sky's Katie Spencer reports. If you can't build a music tech company, it seems like now is the time to buy one. It's no secret the music industry is changing. For the first time since Apple introduced the iTunes store 10 years ago, digital sales of music are down. And the era of streaming music platforms and acquiring them is trending. Sometimes it's a, it's a matter of being at the right place at the right time and getting user traction uh, quickly. Um, Spotify is a, is a company that... Uh, went into an industry that's a uh, very difficult industry to make money in. Uh, people uh, discounted them immediately, saying, you know, it's a, it's a hard company, you're never going to make money, um, it's an impossible business, and they turned it around. When you try your best, but you don't succeed. The battle between streaming and downloads shifted up a gear this week with the release of Coldplay's new album. Not only has Ghost Stories become the fastest selling UK album of the year, it's also only out on iTunes. So are these exclusive deals likely to become more commonplace? You might say that I'm to blame for Rory Gallagher's one of a number of musicians who feels royalties from streaming are leaving artists shortchanged. There's very little return for, for anybody in it, really. It um, mostly goes to the, the owners of the, the companies. This is your Just For You page. And We're seeing a growing trend in music tech acquisitions. Apple may be paying just under £2 billion for music streaming service and headphone maker Beats Electronics. And Twitter has been circling internet audio sharing service SoundCloud. TunePix is an app that allows you to post a picture with a 30-second song clip a social network that claims to be the first to be built, based and funded in Britain. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be hard, but we, we're doing this because we love it. We're excited about the opportunity. I mean, have you ever met anyone in your life that doesn't love music? You know, every person that we show is just like so excited. For tech startups that hit the right notes, the potential is huge. Pandora, by far the biggest streaming music company, but not accessible for users outside of the US, Australia and New Zealand, has around 76 million monthly users and is worth about £3 billion. Music streaming service Spotify's paying global subscribers also grew to £10 million this week, and SoundCloud boasts a £250 million-plus user base and was most recently self-valued at £415 million. I think it's fair to say that streaming is probably going to be the way that we listen to music in the future because you just get such a vast uh, library of, of tracks to listen to at actually a, a pretty low cost. How we listen is changing, and unless sites like iTunes can find a way to level the playing field, more of us could be ditching downloads in the years to come. Katie Spencer, Sky News. It's just a tap away. You're watching Swipe coming up, a celebration of the internet's finest at this year's Webbies. But first, more and more of us are getting around by bike these days, and when it comes to high-tech gadgets, cycling is a massive market right now. From helmet cams to health sensors, how do you know what's good and what's not? Well, we thought we'd send cycling journalist Simon Whiten off to Richmond Park to test a few out. The first product we're looking at today is the Nano Folding Bike. It's an innovative little folding bike, um, and I think it's really good because it's the sort of bike that could influence um, transport policy and make people think about the way they use bicycles. It would easily fit into the boot of your car. It's very light. You can easily move it onto the train or, you know, take it into your office. The only thing I didn't get on with very well was the gearing. I thought the gearing could have been better. It retails for um, £600, this one. A Brompton is going to cost you well over £1,000. This is, this is a good value bike. Whilst the Nano is a great bit of kit, it's fairly low-tech, there's a lot of high-tech kit coming into the booming cycling market and there's one thing that no wannabe pro roadie should be without though and that's a, a Garmin and this is the first Garmin computer that was launched about 10 years ago cycling computer it's um, GPS it completely revolutionized the market because up until then everyone was just training with heart rate monitors and Garmin have just launched this one this is the Edge 1000 computer not only can you use it as a GPS computer to find out where you're going but you can also record your training on it 
with things like cadence, speed, power output, heart rate and so on. Um, it's completely feature packed. If you're going off and you're doing these epic rides, uh, whether it be here in Richmond Park or you're going to the Alps or the Pyrenees, then it's, it's all very well recording your train on, a, on something like the Garmin, but what a great thing to do is actually record your actual ride on a helmet camera. There's loads of different helmet cameras available on the market. Um, the GoPro is probably the most famous, most well-known, but that is very much like a, a normal sort of camera. The great thing about something like this, which is the Drift Innovation Go S, is that it's actually street blind and it looks like it should be on a bike. So for instance, you can mount it on your handlebars like so. It's got a nice aerodynamic shape. Um, the lens part here actually rotates. You can mount it in different positions. You want to put it on a side like that. It's full 1080 HD and it actually records at 60 frames per second, which is, uh, is pretty substantial. So the picture quality is, is very good. This one retails for £320. Um, which is, you know, it's a substantial amount to spend on a on a, a camera. Battery life is really good, three and a half hours. You can also put a 64 gigabyte SD card in it, um, so you've got plenty of room to record even the longest of rides. One great new product is called the Ice Dot Crash Sensor. This is basically, as it sounds, a crash sensor which you fit onto the uh, back of your helmet, and the sensor part of it will detect if you're in an accident. Um, and immediately start a countdown via Bluetooth connection to your mobile phone, which will then text your ICE contacts, so you're in case of emergency contacts. Um, it will then notify them that you have likely been involved in a crash and send GPS coordinates of where that crash occurred. So this is the C-Sense intelligent bike light. Very easy to mount on your bike, very easy to remove. The great thing about this light is that it's an intelligent bike light. So it actually senses what's going on around it. It senses the light levels, it senses the speed of the cyclist is moving at, it senses whether you're going up a hill or not, and it, res it responds and flashes more vividly depending on what you're actually doing. So if you're coming to a junction and you're slowing down, it will flash more vividly. If it suddenly gets darker, if it's a cloud cover or it starts to rain or whatever, it will flash more vividly. And I think I can show you that quite easily. If I just cut my hands over it, to, you can see how it starts to, to, bright, to uh, flash more vividly there, yeah? The C-Sense Intelligent Bite Light retails for £45 for a single light or £78 for a pack of two lights. You know, it's a, it's a pretty good investment. There's nothing else like it on the market at the moment. And I think if you're the sort of cyclist who is commuting on a regular basis at night or maybe early in the mornings or you're going out and you're training in sort of you know, dull conditions, this is a great safety device. You're watching Swipe. Coming up, the mini drone that doubles as a snack, but first. So actors have the Oscars, musicians, well, they've got the Grammys. But what about the stars of the internet? Well, the Webby Awards are all about honouring excellence online. <laughs> Over in New York, comedian Patton Oswalt served as the host of the 18th annual Webby Awards. And there's one rather important rule for Webby winners. Webby acceptance speeches have to be five words or less. Now, I know a lot of you are like, well, that's not a lot of words. Well, you can get a lot done in five words. All right. I think, therefore, I am. Mm? Nice. This baby is yours, Jack. Nice. Unfortunately, some of the evening's winners were more successful at it than others. Don't make me rip your throat out. When Taylor Schilling, the star of Netflix prison comedy Orange is the New Black, went to collect Best Actress, it turned out she wasn't all that good at multitasking. Not when it came to counting and speaking. I now have a Webby! The singers behind What Does the Fox Say picked up the Webby for their viral hit. What does the fox say? The Norwegian comedy duo went for brutal honesty with their acceptance speech. We came for free food. Kickstarter picked up a Webby for the breakout site of the year, and street artist Banksy was the Webby person of the year. Actor George Takai was honoured for a video he made celebrating how retirees use technology. I could do this for hours. Clearly the Star Trek legend was enjoying getting one up on a former castmate. Shatner, eat your heart out. MNC Saatchi won for its hashtag virtual pride campaign to support gay rights in Russia during the Winter Olympics. 
Collecting the award on behalf of the advertising agency was a Vladimir Putin impersonator. Vladimir say, pride is beautiful. Who certainly knew how to win over an audience. Nicola Jude, Sky News. You're watching Swipe. Coming up, we've indie puzzlers and action adventures in this week's games review. But first, here's a roundup of anything you might have missed over the past few days. eBay has asked its 233 million users to change their passwords. The company says a cyber attack compromised its database, which contained encrypted user information. Things like names, email addresses, phone numbers and dates of birth were vulnerable, but not financial or confidential information. What the ICO is doing about this is we're, we're actively looking at the situation with a view to launching a formal investigation because this is, a, uh, on the face of it, a very serious breach. Google has overtaken rival Apple to top the list of the world's most valuable brands. According to a new survey, the search giant is worth £94 billion against Apple's puny £88 billion. The FBI is said to be seriously reconsidering its no-tolerance policy towards employing people who smoke marijuana. The Wall Street Journal quotes FBI Director James Comey as saying the agency is grappling with the question of whether the restrictions prevent the recruitment of hackers. The online storage service Dropbox has bought photo app Bubbly. The mobile app links photos and audios from one location to create a photosphere. It's been quite an expensive few months for Dropbox given its recent acquisition of photo and video cloud storage app Loom and document collaboration service Hackpad. Netflix has announced plans to expand its presence in Europe by the end of the year. The US-based TV and movie streaming company wants to launch in Germany and France, among other countries on the continent. Netflix launched in the UK in 2012, but could face greater challenges in providing dubbed content to new regions. And finally, the world's first mini-drone made from a carrot has taken to the skies. Want the recipe? Well, it would seem you just need to chop one into four to make the crunchy frame and then scrape out a few holes for the electronics. Not terribly practical, but might be good if you fancy a snack. We're flexing our fingers on this week's review from side-scrolling shooters to sci-fi themed RPGs. Our man in the know, Daniel Kruper, has been taking a look. Transistor is a very stylish indie game that's coming to PC and PlayStation 4. Uh, it's from the people who made Bastion a few years ago and it's kind of an action RPG. And now... It's got a beautiful world design that um, kind of, it's kind of if Blade Runner met Tron but also looks kind of Art Nouveau. So it's a beautiful original looking landscape and you play as Red who is a lounge singer who's had her voice stolen by this oppressive regime and you have a, a talking sword. Again, kind of very video game concepts but it's a very interesting narrative in the way that it makes you work to find out what's happened. So you go through this world and you start piecing together the narrative, so it really makes you work for it. Um, Gameplay-wise, it's not all that challenging, but it's kind of action-y, as in it requires reaction times, but requires thoughtful planning, as you'd expect from a more kind of strategy game. So it's a really satisfying blend, and it makes you, if you're used to those kind of games, it makes you try new strategies in a really interesting way. Super Time Force, is, you know, it's a bonkers title and it is a kind of bonkers game. One of the main characters is a dinosaur with a skateboard and there's a lot of like crazy video game stuff and it has this really gorgeous aesthetic retro design where it's all pixel art so it looks like a really old game. But that kind of all hides at its core that it's got a very ingenious gameplay concept. Now I'll try and explain this, I'll probably explain it really badly because it involves time travel, but essentially you start off a level, it's quite a short level, and it's 60 seconds and you can get to the end of the level and you'll probably die. What you can do is you can rewind time, select a different character, and then play alongside your first character again. So effectively you become your own backup. And now you can do this multiple times, so at the end of the game you've got 15 characters on screen and each one of them is you and you've controlled them all in previous playthroughs. It's a really original concept and I think it lets you play with time in a way that only really video games can. And now back to Super Time Force! So Thomas Was Alone is a game that's been kicking around for a few years. It's been on PC, it's been on PlayStation, but this week it's coming to a wider audience like a lot of games are doing these days, coming to iPad. and. It's a really simple, minimalist platformer um, where you play not as kind of standard traditional characters but as abstract shapes. So Thomas, the eponymous Thomas, is a red rectangle. And all of the platforming is quite simple. You just need to get to the end of the level, overcome some obstacles. But the thing that really elevates Thomas Was Alone is the script. It's narrated throughout by British actor Danny Wallace. 
and it's really heartfelt, it's really genuine, it's really witty, and it does this amazing thing, it makes you imbue these abstract shapes that have very mundane names like Thomas and John, uh, with really feelings and you create a connection with them, which is strange since they are just abstract shapes, but it's a really special game and if you haven't played it, it's worth checking out on iPad. First thing to say about Kirby Triple Deluxe, as you should say with all kind of Kirby games, if you want a challenge or you like your games to demand a level of skill, Kirby's probably not for you, but what Kirby offers is kind of a really vibrant, fun, charming world. That's what he's always really done really well. Um, this one's no different. It's not that challenging, but it uses the 3DS wonderfully. The 3DS has a 3D screen, and it uses all the kind of tricks that you would expect them to use in that kind of game, playing with perspective. Um, it has a lot of variety, and ultimately, it's, it's Kirby. It's really charming, and he's, a, he's kind of a second-tier Nintendo character. He's not Mario, but it's still a really good game, and it's a really good outing for Kirby. Thanks, Daniel. And that's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up with the breaking tech stories all week on Sky News for iPad, our smartphone apps, and skynews.com. See you next time. Bye-bye.